Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to I want to apologize first in that I remembered only after I was talking to Donna this morning that I actually do have a picture of the pool where he um, went and washed. So I'll try to bring that next week so that we can see it. I was going back and forth on whether we did, and then Donna and I were talking and I remembered. So I'll bring it next week. This morning is the fourth Sunday in Lent, and we have been journeying through a sermon series that we've called The Valley of Shadows, as each week a story in the life and teaching of Jesus provides us an entry point to see the gathering shadows come close as we near the cross. These stories help us notice the building conflict and rejection of Jesus and to see the shadows in our own lives that keep us from seeing the light of Christ. Together we have named and acknowledged the shadows in our lives, not as a way of making ourselves feel guilty or to feel like we are scum of the earth, but as a way of growing deeper in our relationship with Christ as we journey together towards Easter. Ultimately, naming the shadows is a way of turning towards the light. We've talked together over the past few weeks about the shadow of abundance and how focusing on the good things in our lives can sometimes cause us to lose sight of the one who gave them to us. We've talked about the shadows of temptation and ignorance and isolation and pondering these scriptures and their corresponding shadows have helped us to confess our part in the shadows around us and acknowledge our need to come into the light. If you've missed any of those sermons, I encourage you to go on our website and watch them, epworthalive.com. I think um, it's been a really powerful sermon series for me as I've been able to write it and, um, and do the research, so we invite you to do that. This Sunday, we move into our fifth shadow, the shadow of self-righteousness, and we turn once again to the Gospel of John and focus on the story of the man born blind that we just read. But before we delve a little bit deeper into this um, passage, we're going to take just a moment to watch a short video clip that will illustrate something that we see in this passage. Now, if you have ever seen this video, you are not allowed to cheat. If you cheat, I will know and you will be in timeout after service, okay? So I invite you to um, pay very close attention to the video because it's gonna teach us something really important. If you can't see it, it says count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? Raise your hand if you did not see the gorilla. Oh, awesome, it worked. Right, you can turn it off because I'm going to explain it even though it reads it. It has often been said it makes a difference what you see and how you see what you see. What you just experienced in this short video is called in psychology selective attention. In a nutshell, selective attention is based on the premise that we all have a limited amount of attention to go around. Attention is a limited resource that the brain allocates only to those items deemed relevant or important. So that could be objects or voices or thoughts or counting like it was in the video. And when we focus really carefully on one particular thing, we give little or no attention to other things, even things that might seem wildly out of place or really obvious and hard to miss, like a gorilla coming into the middle of the video. If you didn't see it, we can maybe play it again after the service so you can, you know, it'll make you feel a little dumb the first time you see it because it's really obvious, but it's, it's worth it. We'll play it at the, at the end of worship as everybody's leaving if you want to watch it again. Many of us have experienced this phenomenon in the past even without knowing that you were doing it, and many of us have gotten in trouble for our selective attention. If you've ever been at dinner with someone and you are focused on maybe your phone or your emailing or Facebooking or sending text messages, and then all of a sudden you look up and realize the person across from you is suddenly angry with you, 
That's selective attention. Or another example, in the beginning of our marriage, it happened when we'd go out to eat and Dwight would very, be very selective about the seat. I thought it was because he wanted to sit closer to me or something, but it was just so he could see the TV that was behind my head. And suddenly I'd look up and he would be paying more attention to whatever sporting event was on TV behind me. That's selective attention. The person across from you is annoyed because you're paying attention to your phone and not to them. But more than that, they are mad because your inattention is saying that whatever is happening on your phone or on the TV is more, more important than they are. My mom, I'll tell the story since you're here. <laughs> so my mom, uh, when she reads, becomes very focused. And you can get in her face and scream at her, and she will not, I mean, Virginia, 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 like 50 times until finally you have to scream before you can get her out of the book. That is selective attention, Mom. Perfect example. The same thing happens with our kids too, right? Maybe you've had the experience where you're uh, on the phone or trying to cook dinner in the kitchen or talking to your spouse and your kid comes up with a coloring page or a Lego construction or a test from school and mommy, mommy, look at this and you glance at it and say, that looks great, honey, and go back to what you're doing and then three seconds later and they come back holding something else for you to observe or approve and you offer another glance, another platitude and move right back to what you were doing before and it repeats itself over and over and over again before an exasperation, maybe like me, you say, I can't look at that right now, I'm cooking dinner, go play with your sister. Does that ex happen to anybody else? <laughs> Feeling a little alone, a little alone. So the child stomps away, right, into the other room pouting. Why? Because they wanted your attention and not their sister's. They wanted you to deem them important enough that you spend some of this limited resource, your attention, on them. How we spend our attention is significant, not just because it says something about what we deem important, but because it affects our perceptions of the world around us. There's a guy named Apollo Robbins who is apparently a very well-known pickpocket, and he gave a TED Talk, which is um, a, a company that gives, uh, has people from all um, kinds of different jobs give an eight-minute talk of whatever the most important thing they want to tell the world is. And his um, eight-minute talk, which was the most important thing he wanted to tell the world, was about attention. And he said this, attention is what steers your perception. It is what controls your reality. It is the gateway to your mind. If you don't attend to something, you can't be aware of it. It's like the gorilla walking through the basketball players or the curtain changing colors in the background that you don't even notice. If you don't attend to those things, you won't be aware of those things. But then he says this, ironically, you can attend to something without being aware of it. This is what is often called the cocktail party effect. So you're at a party engaged in your own conversation, and then all of a sudden you hear someone across the room engaged in a different conversation mention your name. They don't say your name any louder than any of the other information that they shared, but you hear your name much more clearly than anything else they said. What we attend to, whether we are aware of it or not, affects our perceptions of the world around us. What you see and how you see what you see makes a big difference. Jesus uses the healing of the, blind, uh, the man born blind to point out the spiritual blindness of those around him. Over and over again in this story, everybody but the blind man demonstrates their inability to see what God is doing. Their attention is focused on all the wrong things, and because their attention is given to the wrong thing, they remain unaware of what God is doing right before their eyes. God's activity in the healing of the man born blind is like the spiritual equi equivalent of a gorilla walking through a basketball game. After reflecting on this passage, one of my friends, um, Reverend David Simpson, said this, Jesus wants us to see that our deeper need is not sight, but insight. This lack of insight or spiritual blindness takes on many forms for us. There is the blindness of fear, of prejudice, and perhaps most insidious of all is the blindness of self-righteousness. It is so easy for us to pick out the faults in others while remaining completely ignorant of our own shortcomings. We think we are better than someone because we have more education or a better job or more money or because we know scripture better or we come to church more frequently. It is this arrogance and self-righteousness of the religious community today day that causes so many people to turn away from the faith. David Simpson says it, is, says it this way, it is always more comfortable to condemn the Pharisees in Jesus' day, day than to exercise the Pharisee in us. 
As we reflect on this passage, we can see clearly that what we pay attention to makes a difference. It shapes the way we perceive the world. At the very beginning of the story, the disciples encounter the man born blind as they're walking, and what they see is a theological problem, a spiritual conundrum to be solved and talked about. In a society where illness was seen as a punishment from God, the disciples wanted to know who sinned that would cause this man to be born blind. Did his parents sin, thereby condemning this man to carry the punishment for their sins, or did the man himself commit some kind of sin as an infant that caused this to happen? The disciples are so focused on the theological conundrum that they remain oblivious that the man in front of them is an actual person, a person who could hear every word they said. He was blind after all, not deaf. He was a person in need of healing and not of debate. After the man's healing, his neighbors and others who had seen him begging notice that this man can see, and they begin to debate among themselves if this is the same man or just someone that maybe looks a little like him. It says they are apparently so divided on the issue that some of them say he's the same man and others say he's a lookalike, and there begins a debate, and despite the man protesting that he is, in fact, the same man they've walked by every day, some of them remain unconvinced. Their attention is so focused on whether or not he is the same person person that they miss the miracle of his healing the pharisees what did they say they knew the law right they knew that lifting dirt and making mud and applying a poultice were all prohibited on the sabbath they spend so much attention on the violation of the command to rest and do no work on the sabbath that they miss the point entirely they forget that the sabbath was intended as a day to restore us to bring us healing and wholeness to reorient us back to god's work in our lives They could not see that the restoration of the man born blind trumps the prohibition of work on Sabbath. The Pharisees focus so much attention on the breaking of the Sabbath that they are forced to the conclusion that Jesus must have committed a sin and that there is then no way that God would use a sinful person to work such a powerful miracle. That's the other really interesting thing, I think, about attention and perception. Not only does more focus in one area mean less attention to others, but our expectations and our motivations affect what we see. They affect our perceptions. There's something that psychologists call wishful seeing, kind of like wishful thinking. Wishful seeing is pretty much what it sounds like. We see what we want to see. My best friend Jen tells a story about herself as a teenager. Now, to to understand this story fully, you have to know that Jen's life revolves around food. She is almost constantly hungry, and her mood reflects her hunger. So whenever she is grumpy, all of us who know her well know that we are to offer her a snack before we ask her what's wrong. That's just the way to do it if you don't want your head bitten off. So she tells this story about when she was a teenager, she lived in a neighborhood that had a stoplight at the entrance. And across the road and sort of down the hill and around a little curve, there was a little shop. And that shop had a frequent changeover of business in the building, presumably because it wasn't uh, the best location. And when you were sitting at the stoplight, she said you could see just the roof of the building and the sign that hung on the roof. That was all you could see. So she said it was interesting for them to watch the seeming perpetual changeover of businesses in the building. And one day she was sitting at the light and she glanced over at the building and got really excited because it said pork and sizzle, which I think is a great name for a restaurant. And Jen was delighted at the idea that there might be a new fun restaurant so close to her house that it was close enough that she could walk. She spent a whole five minutes planning out when she was going to go. It was only when she pointed it out to her friend in the passenger seat that she looked again and realized that the sign actually said, Porch Swing Interior Design, not pork and sizzle. (laughs) Completely different things. Because she saw what she wanted to see. My guess is she was probably hungry. That's wishful seeing. The Pharisees suffer from a bout of wishful seeing in this passage. They see only what they want to see, what they expect to see. They see sin, the breaking of the Sabbath, a man who commits sin, and God doesn't use sinful people. Therefore, they refuse to believe what is right before their eyes, that a man born blind from birth now sees. They even drag his parents in to verify his identity. 
The Pharisees choose not to pay attention to the obvious, to the gorilla that's walking around right across the room from them, to God's activity in this incredible miracle. And instead, they focus on this secondary issue, the timing of the healing. And in doing so, they remain completely unaware, spiritually blind to the true identity of Jesus of Nazareth. They remain blind to the activity of God right in their midst because they are too focused on how they think God ought to act. The man born blind is repeatedly asked how this happened, who healed him. And the man over and over and over again tells the story of Jesus placing the mud on his eyes and telling him to wash, and then of his ability to see. Throughout the story, you see that the man comes to increasing degrees of sight, right? First, he gains his physical sight, and then with each telling of the story, he comes to greater and deeper insights about the man who healed him. Until at the end of the story, he once again encounters Jesus, and there he sees Jesus for who he truly is. Ultimately, the now seeing man was able to recognize Jesus as the Messiah because his attention was focused on the miracle and on the one who brought it about, instead of his preconceived notions of how God was supposed to act in his life. The blind man moves increasingly from darkness and blindness to sight and light, while the Pharisees move increasingly from sight to the blindness of self-righteousness. They are so sure of their own righteousness, of their own insights into how God acts, that they cannot conceive what God might act, that God might act outside of that box that they've constructed. They cannot imagine that God might do a new thing, that God is not conv- confined to a vending machine relationship where certain behaviors guarantee particular results. Now, it's easy for us to read this passage and kind of shake our heads at the Pharisees, wondering how they could have missed this. How could they not get it? But when all of our attention is focused on them, we miss the shadow of self-righteousness that creeps into our own lives. The last few years in the church, there have been lots of attention given to the decline in church attendance. If you have been a leader in the church over the past few years, you've probably um, heard all the conversations and been a part of the time spent trying to figure out why people are leaving church and what we can do to stop this mass exodus from the mainline denominations. I cannot tell you the number of speeches and articles and Facebook posts I've seen about why millennials particularly are leaving the church. Why are there no young adults? Which irritates me because it ignores those of us who are in the church first of all. Now, spending some time reflecting on those things is good, right? Especially when we can do it with an attitude of humility and a willingness to see our own shortcomings and what we need to do to change. But it becomes a misguided thing when we spend so much of our attention on why people are leaving that we forget to act like Jesus. Maybe instead of worrying about why people are leaving or who is right about a particular theological issue, maybe we should be focused on feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and visiting the prisoner. Maybe instead of fighting about this type of worship music or that type of worship music, we should be focused on helping people find jobs and getting better access to clean drinking water. Maybe instead of complaining about high crime rates and drug addiction, we should be spending time caring for those who feel forgotten and overlooked and unloved and unlovable. Maybe instead of complaining about single parents and how terrible it is for the kids, we should be walking alongside those parents and kids and offering homework and babysitting and cooking dinner every once in a while so that they can spend quality time together. Maybe instead of wishing things were the way they used to be, we should be looking for and celebrating the new things that God is already doing in our midst. When we begin to do these things, to focus on what God is doing in our midst rather than on how we think God ought to act, we begin to notice. As the writer of um, the the book that we're reading in Lent says, Jesus is right here already, kneeling in front of us, making a paste out of the situation and his own holiness. And then we, like the blind man, will be able to see one thing I know. I was blind, but now I see. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.